Okay. It is Thursday. We have lightning talks and we have, um, looks like nine marvelous speakers doing eight things. And first up we have Karim Khazem, is that right? Talking about effortless reliability. This is why I was handing you a mic. Yep. Stand by. Uh, now we need to hear you. Okay, is that, can everyone hear me? No? Can we hear? Test, hello. Can everyone? <laughs> right, okay, so uh, everyone can hear me? So um, here I have a list of uh, software which is critical for the health of the, uh, for the, for the free software ecosystem and which the core infrastructure initiative has said um, is vulnerable uh, or at risk to heartbleed style bugs. So what I figured out is that from this list of important and vulnerable software, those ones don't have any kind of test suite at all, okay? So there's some very important software here. We need it to be reliable, but it's very difficult to do quality assurance on it because uh, there's no test suite. In many cases, the upstream maintainers are irresponsive. Um, so what do we do about software like this? I'm not going to write test suites for it, neither are you. So I'm going to be proposing uh, a new approach to quality assurance, which will be complementary to existing efforts at Debian, um, which will be good for software like this, but also will be beneficial for all software that's packaged in Debian and which uh, uh, solves the technical challenges and also social and cultural challenges uh, that are associated with quality assurance at Debian. So what I'm proposing is an infrastructure with the following three properties. The first one is you give the infrastructure a Debian package, thanks, that's all right, um, and it generates a whole bunch of uh, genuine bug reports, so no false positives. The second property is that um, it, the infrastructure must be able to generate uh, bug reports uh, without any kind of per package individual setup. And the third property is that uh, this must be a service. I don't want the obligation to be on maintainers to download this thing. I want it to be a centralized service. So what's the point of these three properties? If we have a centralized service that generates genuine bug reports for Debian packages uh, and which does not require any knowledge or setup per Debian package, when we have this, we can turn it on by default for every single Debian package and get bug reports for every single Debian package without the maintainers having to do a single thing. What I'm hoping is that one day the maintainers will uh, look at the package webpage and there will be a kind of health report for their package with uh, results from all kinds of bug finding tools telling them any problems. Uh, there'll be kind of line numbers and descriptions of bugs. Contributors will be able to click on the line number, go to sources.debian.net, uh, fix the bug and then easily send a patch to the maintainer. Okay, so how did this work in practice? So my PhD supervisor already has something like this at the university. He runs a static analysis tool called CBMC on the entire Debian code base and he has used this to file hundreds of bugs uh, and many of them have been fixed. So we're proposing integrating this into Debian, uh, running free, uh, freely available static analysis tools like CBMC and Infer on the entire Debian code base in order to find bugs. We also would like to run dynamic analyses on the entire Debian code base like uh, Valgrind or Helgrind. Uh, to help with this, I'm actually developing a tool which, uh, called SMID, which automatically interacts with, uh, with interactive programs using sensible user inputs. So we're hoping that this will benefit two groups of people. First of all, uh, people who already are familiar with the code base will get the benefits of uh, the results of uh, these high quality static analysis tools that don't generate any false positives and only tell you about genuine bugs. And they won't have to do all of the boring setup because we will do all of this stuff centrally. 
But more importantly, I'd also like to encourage new contributors to Debian, so ad hoc contributors, uh, to start fixing bugs rather than just adding features to, to um, Debian packages. So for example, I'd, lo I'd love to see students who are looking for a fun project over the summer to easily be able to see a list of bugs uh, and easily be able to kind of jump to where the bug is in the source code and fix it and, and, and send a patch upstream. Uh, without necessarily having knowledge of the whole co code base, so doing all the easy stuff and leaving the more difficult or intricate issues for the upstream maintainers. So, uh, in summary, um, I'm proposing to implement this thing, so an infrastructure that finds genuine bugs uh, with no setup per package uh, offered as a service so that we can run it by default for everything uh, to help both people who understand the code base uh, and also to encourage new ad hoc contributors to Debian to kind of help them get into free software and into Debian and into quality assurance. And so making this as easy as possible. Um, so uh, I'd love to hear ideas about this. So um, we've already got a, a lot of this work is already based on things which are already in Debian and we're gluing a lot of this stuff together. Um, I, if you've got ideas, either about the big ideas or the details, I'd love to speak to you about it and, and listen to your ideas. So uh, my name is Karim. Uh, my PhD supervisor is Debian developer Mikhail Tauchnik. Uh, and I'd love to speak to you afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up are Axel and Frank Hoffmann. And they're going to talk about this book that they've just come up with. This is ours. Hello, my name is Frank Hoffmann, this is Axel Beckert, and uh, both of us, we are writing a book. This book is named uh, Debian Package Management Book, and um, we would like to present you what we did so far. Yeah, so uh, we've written on that book already for two and a half years. And um, it will feature dpackage, it will feature apt, aptitude, and the whole apt ecosystem around it. It will be in German initially, but uh, an English translation is planned. And the big news, um, it is already under a free license since like one week. You can uh, uh, get it on GitHub, the sources. It will be available as ebook. Actually, you can already build your own ebook from sources uh, now, it's PDF or EPUB format. Um, there's a printed book planned at the Onyx Neon uh, publisher, um, whom I have to pl uh, the pleasure to be here. Alison is sitting somewhere there. Yeah, thanks for coming. And it will also be uh, available as Debian package in the future. So packaging is already there. Yeah, you can get the um, source code on GitHub. Uh, DPMB is the Debian Package, man package Management Book or on German Debian Paket Management Buch. Same abbreviation, hence we cho uh, have chosen that one. So if you want to contribute or found a typo or even if you have complaints about the content, fork it, fix it and file a pull, pull request. And um, thanks to Mechthilde, over there, we already had our first pull request today. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's how uh, you can build the book yourself. But I think, um, as how many minutes do we have? Oh, okay. Well, so okay. we can uh, still uh, show that page a little bit. It's quite easy. You need ASCII doc and. Uh, Docbook LaTeX, um, you clone the uh, repository, uh, change in the freshly created directory, and type make, and like 10 minutes later or so, depending on the machine, you'll have an EPUB, a PDF, and an HTML file, or you can even run a dpackage build package on it and install it as a dep. Works the same, more or less. And yeah, here are the links um, for those who are can easily remember German words, Debian, Debian Paket Management.de, or um, those who don't want to type that much, dpmb.org. Um, the slides are also on, uh, online. They are also ASCII doc. Um, you can find them uh, in the organization account under talks. 
Uh, we also have an email address to contact us both if you have questions. And yeah, actually that was it. And looking forward to get uh, pull requests, fix typos, and maybe later uh, people who want to buy the book when it's printed. If you have if you have questions, if you want to contribute, if you, uh, if you have questions regarding which part is included, if you would like to add certain features, if you think something is missing, just contact us, talk to us. We are happy to hear your information. Thank you. One FAQ, the book will not be about um, packaging stuff. It will just be about handling the binary packages. So that would uh, be far too much. Thanks. OK, um, we'll just have some singing and dancing whilst we wait for the setup. But actually, here comes Andre, whose name I still haven't pronounced properly once. Um, and he is talking about how can SO use reuse port improve UDP performance. Uh, hi, this is Andre. Is uh, proper pronunciation. Um, and uh, uh, who, who thinks they know what SO reuse port is? Okay, and who who confuses that with SO reuse other than? <laughs> Okay, so uh, the SO reuse port uh, was a feature um, uh, which was introduced in Linux 3.9 and it was, well, meant for TCP first because uh, there was also a bottleneck for TCP. And it's a feature of Network Socket API and uh, it gives a lot of performance boost on multi-core systems. So uh, it allows you to bind the same port from multiple threads which, well, Normally you would do as well, but the threads will compete, which uh, um, you can see here. There are um, several queues in the. Well, it depends on your internet card, but there are uh, there are network cards that have separate queues. So if you have multiple uh, incoming queues on the internet card, then there are several receiving threads uh, in the kernel, but it comes all down to the single socket and single buffer. There's a uh, lock which distributes. Uh, this incoming packets between the threads in the, uh, for example, DNS server, because we are writing DNS server and we want to have the fastest DNS server in the world. So uh, this is the situation uh, without SO reuse port. So the threads compete uh, for, for, the for the sockets and uh, this, uh, the incoming packets are not uh, distributed evenly. With SO reuse port, uh, this well, all those slides are simplified because it's much more complicated. But uh, with a SO report, uh, um, uh, the, the incoming packets are distributed between threads uh, evenly. Uh, there's some hashing algorithms, so, so well, the packets are uh, pinned to each thread according to the source address and stuff like that. But uh, basically, it, it looks like this uh, af after, after you well, use a SO report. And uh, it can get even better. There's an interface uh, uh, in the slash sys where you can pin individual queues on the network card to individual well threads. But uh, uh, we are not there yet because it's more complicated because of the hash function I told you about that distributes it uh, uh, a little bit different. But uh, the difference uh, uh, we we've seen. The, the blue lines are different versions uh, at, at the top, are different versions of, uh, of not DNS. And the top line uh, peaks at uh, 800,000 uh, queries per second. And uh, before it was something like four, uh, 400,000 uh, packets per second that we were, ba we were able to process. So it's almost, uh, it almost doubled the performance on the same hardware just by uh, using uh, the single kernel option and well, you need to well optimize the number of threads uh, so it matches the number of queues on the network card, but well, so almost a double, uh, double performance boost. Yep, that's it.
And it can be used, of course, for any, any GCP or, or UDP uh, server out there. Thank you. Okay, right. Next, Tim Ansell will inform us how and why and in which fashion he has too many projects. Hi, um, I'm Tim and I'm from Australia and I have too many projects. I also have too many slides. So if you could tell me every 30 seconds, that would be great. Um, I need help because I really need to sleep. And since this is a Debian, package, uh, Debian conference, um, I need help with packaging things because I'm upstream and being in Debian is awesome. Um, if you're a Perl hacker, tune out for a second. Um, if you're not, um, Python Datetime TZ is a Python module you should be using if you use Python and dates. Um, however, app get install Python Datetime TZ, the computer says no, so I would love help there. Um, as well, if you're using Python and you're tired and it's 2 a.m. and you want to debug your server, use the Q module. It's printf debugging on steroids. Um, basically, you queue anything and it ends up in a file. You can queue a function, um, a class, does everything. Again, also not in Debian. I would love help there. Um, I also don't like small projects. I have a big project, which is the Tim Videos project. Um, it's a bunch of projects which are trying to do recording and live streaming, um, basically to replace the DV switch pipeline that's currently being used at DebConf. Um, however, I can't make your content interesting, but I can help make it readable. Um, I have a tool to do that called SlideLint. SlideLint is basically a presentation proofreader it checks that um, your slides are good. They don't have the common pitfalls. There's a command line version um, that needs packaging. There's a website version, which you don't need to package because it's a service. Um, so the question is, how do you record a live stream at a conference? This is how. Um, first, you need some capture hardware. We're working on a project called the HDMI to USB to do capture. It's FOSS um, firmware. Um, it kind of sits here. It captures from the computer or the camera. Um, we have two firmwares which do this, one in VHD on Verilog and one which is written in Python. Um, they need to be packaged so that people don't need to build them from source. They can just app get install HDMI to USB firmware. Um, the new firmware is written in Python. Um, you still need to understand hardware, but it's much easier than Verilog. I would love help packaging the dependencies that needs. Um, we also have open hardware. This is a, the Numuntu Opus board. Um, you can sign up to get it. Um, it has two HDMI input, two HDMI output, DisplayPort in, DisplayPort out, USB, gigabit ethernet, and expansion port. Um, you could probably use it for other things, um, such as video DJing and stuff like that. Um, it's all open. The schematic's up on GitHub right now, and it's done in KiCad, so you can even use free tools to look at your free hardware. Um, but once you captured it, you need to do mixing. Um, so I have a project called GST Switch, which replaces DV Switch, which is a software video mixer that does HD. It's written in C, has a Python API. Um, that needs packaging as well. Um, I wrote it in C because I thought C was better, uh, for this, but the Chaos Club decided that they like Python better, so they rewrote a version in Python called Voctomix. Um, they would love help with that. Um, that probably needs packages as well. Um, once you've done that, you need to stream it. There's a website and a flu motion based thing. Um, that needs better packaging because the upstream for flu motion is dead, and we have our own custom version of it and need help. How do you package that? I have no idea. Um, but you still need people to know about your event, um, live streaming and stuff. So I also have Events Everywhere, which is a bunch of command line tools for doing um, publishing of your event to Facebook, Google+, Plus, Eventbrite, Meetup. Um, so yes, that is a summary of some of my projects. I have more. Um, just in summary, Tim's video, 
live event recording, slide lint, make your slides better, HDMI USB, capture, GST switch, software mixing, streaming system, streaming, events everywhere, publish your events everywhere, um, support open hardware and come and get a um, board. I apparently have misjudged it and have 30 seconds. So here I have one of these boards here. Um, if you're interested in looking at it, Come and find me later. I also have business cards so you can um, find me later. Everything is open. I like open source software. Go Debian. Thank you, Tim. Made it with five seconds remaining. Well done. Okay, up next is Martin Pitt. Finally there when I expect him. Um, talking about auto package tests for CI. Have a microphone. Thank you. So, hello, I'm Martin Pitt, uh, the auto package test maintainer in Debian. And I, I think it's safe to say that so far, writing auto package tests uh, for packages has been quite a great success. We have over 4,000 packages in the, Ubuntu, uh, in the Debian archive. And because we do forward and reverse dependency coverage with those, we actually cover a lot more with those. So I think every other upload in Debian and Ubuntu triggers one, way one or more tests. Nevertheless, the motivation for maintaining and creating more uh, could even be greater. We have about 300 tests in Debian which have never succeeded, so which are just broken. And we often get test regressions which nobody really cares about. And I believe this is because we don't really use those tests uh, uh, to their full potential. So we don't use them for continuous integration, only as a, maintain, uh, as a convenience for the maintainer. So Antonio Tessero set up this wonderful infrastructure on ci.debian.net, which I hope you're all familiar with, uh, which dutifully executes all those tests, and then we completely ignore them for testing migration. <laughs> and this needs to change. So the this is how an excuse looks in Debian right now. So Brittany is the machinery which decides whether and when to propagate a package from a unstable to testing. And it commonly takes into account like age and whether it's built and installable. But there's a big thing missing, which is tests. But Brittany would be the, the right place to actually trigger the test and evaluate the results. So this is how uh, excuses look in Ubuntu. We have a Brittany branch which actually does that. So whenever we upload a package, it triggers the test for that package and all of its reverse dependencies. And as soon as there is a regression, then the package gets blocked, period. And this helps us to essentially ratchet towards a situation where we never regress the, uh, the development release. So, and this is, of course, not to pack about the, the own cloud maintainers here. This is just a random example I fished out of excuses yesterday. But you see, even though the packages test themselves is perfectly fine, it detected now that the new V object uh, module somehow broke the DAF module. <coughs> and this is, of course, just a trivial case. Consider if someone uploads a new Perl, or as we currently do, Python 3.5. This literally triggers hundreds of tests. And only if, they, if all the regressions of them have been sorted out, then the whole thing migrates to like testing at once. Or the development release in the Ubuntu's case. And so my plea to, to us is please let's put these tests into action and integrate them into, in, into Debian so that we stop having the weird situation that we can detect regressions, but we don't. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is DKG talking about Debian slash upstream slash signing key, so, sorry, signing hyphen key dot ASC, documenting your upstream signatures. Um, should I do some dancing before he starts? No, he's ready. Excellent. Um, I was trying to make it full screen, but it doesn't seem to go full screen. I don't know why. Uh, okay, not F5. And F11 doesn't do anything. So you're, oh. Sorry, whoever's laptop this is. Anyway, um, anyway, I'm going to begin because my time has started. So you can't read this because the browser doesn't work properly here. Um, so uh, if you're a Debian package maintainer, 
you want to uh, verify your upstream signatures on your package. Who here has an upstream that signs their uh, tarballs? And who here verifies the signatures every single time that they p fetch a new tarball? Those numbers are not identical. Let's fix that. <coughs> so upstream re releases a tarball. They also release a signature. That signature file is right next to it. What is that signature file? It is a GPG signature. So this is a very common pattern we see in most of our upstreams. So why do you want to check them? You want to check them because you want to make sure that you only distribute what upstream intends to distribute. I mean, we may patch them, but we want our patches to be on top of what upstream says. Um, you want to detect any sort of network attack that goes against you. Why would some do a network attack against you by modifying the file that you're fetching? They're actually attacking all Debian users through you, the packager. We owe our users more than that, so let's protect them. We're closing a gap here. Um, if we get archive support for this, and if the package, if the, if the fonts were right here, you'd see it says wider distribution, um, then we could actually start distributing upstream signatures with our, patch, uh, wi with our packages so that upstream signatures are more widely known around the network and more available to everyone. Um, <coughs> so uh, how do you do this? So this is stuff that's in your Debian directory. If you're a packager, Debian Watch is how you check um, for new versions of upstream. Debian Watch has this mechanism where you can say PGP sig URL mangle equals, and this says, well, we'll look for the same file name, but it ends in .asc instead of the tarball. So just put that uh, ops PGP sig URL mangle. This is in the uScan man page if you're interested. Um, just pop that in there, and uh, you will look for a new upstream signature. And then you make this file, Debian upstream signing key dot ASC. It is an ASCII armored version of upstream's um, signing key. Anyone know whose signing key that is? I'm kidding. Um, OK, so this all works now. Right now, you can put this in your package. Um, so, <coughs> sorry, the archive is below the red line, and uScan is above it. uScan already handles this. Uh, uScan needs a way to find it. That's uh, watch. uScan needs a way to know upstream signing key. Um, so that's the Debian uh, uh, upstream signing dash key dot ASC. Um, <coughs> Dpackage dev already accepts dot ASC and dot DSC. I was informed by Anscar, but have not had a chance to test that actually I, I'm, I, d I owe him one more check mark here, which is that DAC already now accepts the dot ASC files, so we can distribute them alongside the orig.tar.gz. And hopefully soon, once that's in place and we all know it, uh, Dpackage dev will find that dot ASC lying around and automatically put it in your dot DSC so we can distribute them. Uh, so there's a bit of a few concerns here. Um, what if upstream doesn't sign their software? What do you do? Okay, let's not kick our upstreams. Let's go to them friendly-like and say, it looks like you don't, you're not signing your software. Let me help you figure out how to do it. We're actually in a pretty good position to do that. We can say, look, Debian is doing this. We're trying to distribute signatures for all of our co code, including upstream signatures. We would like to distribute your signature too. If you don't have an open PGP key yet, I'll help you figure out how to do it. Um, help, them, help them change their mind. Um, if their signatures are not binary, if they're in the .sig form instead of the .asc form, we might have to do a little bit of translation. That's uh, a bit of bug work that we can do. We can fix that. We can translate from binary to .asc signatures. And if their signatures are not in the open PGP form, that's a totally separate question. That's additional work that we can do. We can distribute those as well if we want to, though. So my point here is, though, you may not know about this, but please be aware of it and check your upstream signatures. It'll all, like the tooling is designed to check them for you. So that's it. I've got one minute left. I can take one very, very short question with a very short answer. I, shout it out, I'll repeat it. Uh, Kernel.org signing style. Uh, okay, uh, that's not currently handled yet. Um, talk to me, let's figure out how to handle it. Um, signed, signed upstream git tags would be awesome. Um, I don't know how to handle that because of the relationship between the git tag and the tarball. Uh, but yeah, talk to me. I'm happy to help you figure out how to make it work if you've got stuff like that. Thanks. Next is Aaron Ucko talking about spotting and fixing build failures. And here he is. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Aaron, and I'm a serial bug filer. 
I have filed a fair number of fa uh, fail failure to build, build from source bugs over the last few years, m including some just this week, despite not being an official porter or build view maintainer, just a regular DD who cares about portability and rebuildability. As such, I decided to, to take the opportunity to explain what I've been up to. All I really needed was a foreign CH root and a script I threw together, which I've now posted on people.debian.org. I specifically focused on new binary packages because regress, regress to, uh, of, of existing packages already blocked migration to testing, so we'll presumably get developers' attention sooner or later. I found a few common sources of trouble, which I've outlined here. I'll hold off for now on elaborating on most of these, but I'd like to point out one subtly that's sometimes been an issue, namely that um, I386 architectures use a processor type of I386 and multi-arch paths, but I586 and GNU toolchain tuples, so the GNU type and multi-arch variables are not, in fact, synonymous everywhere, and people should not uh, assume that they are. At any rate, uh, Debian has some nice web applications that are useful for checking out individual, individual packages or all of your packages, or for subscribing to build failure notifications. I encourage everyone to keep tabs on their packages one way or another. Meanwhile, my broader approach has been to use a custom script that piggybacks on aptitude tracking of new packages and identifies packages that are new on AMD64 but unavailable altogether on A3D6 or vice versa. It leaves a, yields a link to buildy.debian.org, which has some very helpful features these days. Once I open the link, I often look at the list of failing architectures and report bugs that are appropriate. In some cases, the jury is still out, so I check back later. When, when I do file bugs, I generally include my take on what appears to have gone wrong and how the maintainer might address it. I guess I've still got time, so I will go back to um, some of the common failure modes. Um, so yeah, build, build depends could be undeclared altogether or misclassified as relevant only for uh, article independent packages. Um, there could be other cases um, where, where I, um, the reference um, the, the, the Debian rules assumes that the doc package is going to be built when it isn't necessarily. Um, there can be architecture specific variation in um, generated symbols files, especially for C++ libraries. The um, KD team has a tool for, for tracking this, and they're, they're generally pretty good about using it. Um, sometimes upstream forgets that other alternate operating systems such as k 3 or the herd exist, or um, sometimes they, they also assume, they assume that everything is a 64-bit system, even though there are still plenty of 32-bit systems out there. Um, so it, sometimes, again, because I'm tracking that new packages specifically, sometimes the build environment has changed fr from when it was first uploaded, and so no longer builds it against the current um, unstable. And also the auto-builders have some quirks, so they have no, no useful home directory, they don't necessarily have any network you can rely on, and so forth, and you need to account for that possibility. Okay, that's all. Well, we may have today's land speed record. Next up is Didier Rabou talking about from pr Debian printing to printing Debian. Here, Monsieur Didier. Wow. So, from Debian printing to printing Debian. Why me? Uh, I'm, you might know that I'm the maintainer of the Debian printing stack, cups and other things. And sometimes uh, I do have weird ideas. So I have a dream. What we do is great. We have to acknowledge that. Debian is the largest ordinated free software collection ever built in history, and will stay that way for quite long. We have 175 gigabytes of source uh, across that long number that I can't read in English, lines of source code for Jesse. That's just insane. But source code is immaterial. It's, it just is something that lives on our computers, but you can't actually feel it. So what about crystallizing this heritage into the physical world? Let's print the whole Debian source code. <laughs> Easy, right? Think of this as an art project. Digital heritage for humanity. Put that in a museum with everything that was ever published in free software in a coordinated way. This could be useful in future ages when all computers disappeared, but someone finds this collection of paper with things printed on them and might even understand what that is and how to put that back to use. Of course, there are challenges. Typesetting 175 gigabytes of source isn't exactly easy. You can't really do it by hand, right? I mean, unless some volunteers in the room? No, right. We have many non-text plane files, images, sound, etc. And uh, it's not exactly feasible to generate one single PDF out of that. I don't know if you ever tried to generate hundreds of pages PDF. It's not exactly easy, and it's probably memory bound. So 
we need to find ways to do that. But we have precedent there. Wikipedia typesetted the English version. 15 giga gigabytes of text, we have three times that. Five million pages, 7,000 volumes. They actually printed, I think, 25 or 30 volumes, and the rest are available as, as PDF. And they uploaded all the PDFs on lulu.com, where you can actually buy the whole 7,000 volumes for a half million, if you want. Well, the amongst the challenges, the question is, what is the amount of paper you actually need? Uh, we, have to, we have to decide about the format. Is that would that be a list of books, just A4 pages? Uh, we have to decide if we use recycled paper. I mean, recycled paper wears out. So you, you might want to buy quality paper and print using Chinese dark ink, something like that. And then there's this ecology question. Of course, it, it could eat a small forest, but we don't need to print this multiple times. We just need one instance. And then you have to actually print that. So the current prices are around two cents per A4 page. So then you have to decide how you want to actually book bind, how many volumes. Uh, does anyone have ideas for sponsors for the printing? I might need to talk to HP, right? <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> and well, another idea that we had yesterday very late was that you we could crowd print that. You could pick one volume and decide, yeah, I will print that home and send that to the museum ex ex exhibition, for example. We could try that. And then there is the question, where do we put this one copy? A museum, art, art exhibition? Ideally, not one time. If that, is, if that is supposed to be a heritage thing, it has to be kept there forever. And no, my place is not a good place for this, right? <laughs> Finances. So we also need to kind of finance that. But I've heard Devin has some money. <laughs> Perspective and ideas. One idea we, ha we had also is this bring me anywhere in the Debian source code. Like you go into your, your library, you take one book, you open it, and you land in, I don't know, ghost script source code. But we could start with a web version. Bring me anywhere in Debian, and then you can infinite scroll up and down. This is not too hard to do in with web technologies, especially now that we have source Debian net. And the exhibition wa could be about the printing process. Instead of actually having all the books, we could have a printer that just continuously over probably decades <laughs> would print <laughs> the Debian source code. I need help, so I, I created an alias project page. <laughs> join, the, join the alias project, we can discuss this. Uh, last year everyone said I was crazy, but this year might be in the price of the beer, I don't know what, but people actually are trying to consider this. So join me and we'll have fun. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, just as a reminder, we have another session of Lightning Talks on Saturday, same time, 3 o'clock. We also have a session of live demos tomorrow at 2. Um, there are still a few slots available for the Saturday Lightning Talks session, so send any proposals. Um, for talks, not marriage, to islightningreal at debconf.org. Thank you very much, and good night.